every day I wake up and I work for a company. Not my company, all these other companies. And I'm not gonna sit here and act like I'm one of those people who don't sleep with my phone in my bed, I do. I'm not gonna act like I don't check my phone first thing in the morning, I do. I'm addicted. And it's not just me, millions of us are. So why don't you just get off social media? <laughs> what? I just think it's funny you think it's that simple. This isn't about our phones. This is about a relationship between our senses and the culture. We've entered an age of information glut. And this is something no culture has really faced before. The typical situation is information scarcity. Lack of information can be very dangerous, but at the same time, too much information can be very dangerous because it can lead to a situation of meaninglessness. This is the whole question. If culture is communication, and if it's shared information, then what is our culture now? Amazon, Apple, Facebook, Warner, all these media companies have invested over like $40 billion in content in the past year. The question isn't just why, but at what cost? What do you mean at what cost? I mean, what do we lose? I'm Alex Wolf. I'm an author, an artist. Some call me a digital anthropologist, but I just like to call myself human. I love studying culture, people, technology, I like trying to figure out how we got here, how ideas go from weird to normal. It's a revolutionary mobile thing. There's been a shift in the modern economy in the past few decades where it feels like the only thing left for sale is our attention. As a society, we're openly and massively addicted to these like digital ad plantations that make money from our focus. It's how we keep in contact with our friends, our family, our president. You gotta wonder how did it get to a point where our eyeballs are the only thing that mattered? Because as an artist, I've struggled with the incentive to make things for metrics or for meaning. I'm a part of this myself, and I just feel like I wanna know how to navigate a world where every day my ability to focus, my attention is for sale. You talked about the eyeball? Yes. <laughs> Explain that. I don't think a lot of people realize that 90% of the information we absorb is visual. And this was an amazing asset for traveling the world. It helped us invent new sciences and figure out where we are in the universe. When the printing press was released into the market by Gutenberg in the 1400s, at that time, people were thrilled to use their eyeballs to do something that's not as common today, which is read. Little words printed on big papers were like feasts to the eyes, and it was one of the best ways to feel connected to the outside world and your imagination. And by the 1800s, something revolutionized this special, intimate relationship with the printed word, which was the camera, of course. The thing I've always found fascinating about the camera is how much it looks and acts like an eye. Humans create technologies to extend our natural capabilities. So like shovels are extensions of our hands, wheels are extensions of our feet. So it makes sense that we'd want to build a camera because it's like a mechanical portable eye that you can use to capture moments you know won't last. Anyway, after cameras started to get better, cheaper, and easier to use, they started to transform our society and they were on the covers of magazines and newspapers which created a different standard for humans to absorb information, an easier standard. One where people didn't have to look and guess little words, but where they just had to look. And this was great for magazines and newspapers because it meant they could entice their readers and of course for advertisers because they got to use an array of stimulating visuals. That's what it all comes down to, stimulation. Your eyes are designed to honor stimuli, no matter how cheap or exploitative it is. So if you put an image next to text, your eyes are gonna naturally drift away to the image. It's natural, images control us. 
As our society became more photocentric, there became an ecological difference in the way we interacted with information and human behavior changed on a collective level. And it didn't take long before it warped even more because of the television, of course. <laughs> it might be the most American invention of all time because it's a box that projects images, but not just images, moving ones that totally influenced a generation of people to figure out what they wanted to wear, what they wanted to think, and of course, what they want to buy. And it didn't take long for TV producers to realize that Americans want to be amused for as long and as much as they possibly can. That's the other thing that's really interesting to me is entertainment. Because just as humans seem to be mostly visual, we also seem to be mercilessly attracted to all types of amusement. We dive headfirst into any enticement that one-ups the appearance of boredom, and we have an unlimited appetite for distraction. It's gotten us into a lot of trouble. What do you mean? Well, it's changed the way I can talk to you. I'm a writer, so I'd like to speak to you in little text on a page. But my text on a page is competing with all the stimulating images and videos you're used to seeing every day. So that means that even if you want to read what I or any other writer has to say, your eyes are going to drift away into all the competing stimulation. Every millennial I know wants to read more, but they feel like they can't. And it's because they can't. That's not true. People still read. <laughs> You know, it's funny because people tell me that people still read and I feel like I, it's only to make themselves feel better. People don't read, readers read, okay? Reading has become a novelty that's as niche as like scrapbooking. There was once a point in our culture where it was a normal thing to read. You can sit down and read for hours, but the way our culture is set up, our environment is not fit to honor that anymore. I mean, the thing that you can't let go of from the moment you wake up to the moment you fall asleep, we call it a phone, but that's a skeletal term. It's not really a phone. It's a 24 seven amusement device and it's scattered the collective attention span to pieces. The visuals on here from the perspective of the eyeball are fantastic, they're infinite. And with stimulation like that, why would the eyeball even bother to go back? Companies that make money from selling ads, it used to be newspapers and magazines and now it's social media. They all work with the same business model and it works like this. Say there's a model named Julia and Julia's beautiful and every time Julia does something, people look at her. This is great for those eyeball companies because they make more money the more they get people to look. Not for how much they get people to learn things or enjoy things, just to get people to look. So a brand who's having a hard time selling their soda or whatever will come to one of these eyeball companies and say, hey, we see you've got a bunch of eyeballs. We wanna slab this expensive, irrelevant ad in front of Julia because we know people are looking at her and we hope that if people see our stuff after they see her, they'll wanna buy it. It's not a bad idea, but it's lazy because these eyeball companies don't really care if it annoys the crap out of the people on their platform or if no one even wants soda. They get the money either way. And Julia doesn't have to be beautiful. She can be wacky or funny or whatever's gonna capture people's attention, whatever's gonna capture your line of vision. And so these companies are meeting the demand of the soda company, not the people. There's no demand for ads. But the funnier part is that the soda company is basing all of this on a faulty metric. And it's usually a view count of some sort, some kind of metric that says how much something's been watched. And it's just watched, just looked at, just splattered in front of your face, not engaged with, not interacted with, not indulged in, not cared about. And the result is you and I live in a world where we have to use our eyeballs thousands of times a day to avoid this stimulation. Not only does it train our brain to avoid boredom, it makes the idea of it incomprehensible. We're so used to laboring our eyes to navigate the world that the irony is we can't even see what's going on. When heaps of entertainment are designed just to be injected next to ads, it creates the standard which becomes a lethal combination to society. Because only things that are sensationalized and visually stimulating are rewarded. And what happens is that this only lets junk content in and it pushes sophisticated information out. <laughs> And now we've been trained to think that all information should be easy to absorb, when in reality, information doesn't work that way. Before ideas could be short and visually stimulating and simple, people had to dedicate entire lives to figure out the complexities in things like math and science and philosophy. 
The best way I can describe it is that we used to live in a world where people had to be calculators to understand math. And now we only live in a world that handles a mechanical calculator's output. You don't need to know what 50 times 7 is. You just need to know how to enter it on a screen. Because topics have been indexed, formulas have been categorized, and now our world is sort of a playpen of results. I mean, of course not everything is figured out, but we think it is. And when you only have outputs, when you only have the parts of the world that have been simplified enough just to be spit out, not only do you have less understanding, but less incentive to figure out how anything actually works. Because of the stimulating nature of our culture, there are ideas that cannot and will not penetrate public discourse because they lack visual stimulation or simplicity. They can't get in. If your attention span is eight seconds and there are ideas that need 30 seconds, 300 seconds, 3,000 seconds that can't penetrate your focus, if people can't pay attention to each other, then what happens to the world? So, are you saying you get rid of ads? No, no. I'm a capitalist, so I believe in the power of free trade and commerce, but I also believe in the individual. And I don't think we need to get rid of ads, but I do think we need to strive for better business models. Ones that consider the ecological quality of our experience and don't just profit from interrupting our focus or cost the nation the ability to pay attention. Because attention being for sale so neglectfully like this has made it so that it'd be like offering unsweetened iced tea to someone who's only used to drinking it with sugar. So like an average guy. <laughs> yeah, exactly. There's too much to lose if we keep exploiting our eyes and our senses like this. Art is under threat because as I mentioned, the industries behind it are being ran by the wrong metrics. Goodhart's Law, I don't know if you're familiar with it, explains that once a metric is sought for, it ceases to become meaningful and no longer measures the desired result. And we see this all the time with record labels and galleries and any third-party platforms that use a metric like a follower count to distinguish good artists. And you can see it, the quality of our music, film, photography, literature has suffered. Intellectualism is under threat because people need space to reflect and intellectualize things. But the rate that information enters our lives leaves us with no time to grapple the processes and dialogue that make life significant. And of course, probably the scariest of them all is the quality of human relationships. Life is made up of attention, where you put it and who you give it to. And today, it is in a constant war of exploitation, given the distracting nature of these business models. We're a culture that seeks attention online instead of at home, and it's completely fragmented the means of communication with the people we'd like to be closest to. If we want to at least try to salvage what's being burned, it means that we need to create better systems beyond this outdated method of harvesting attention just for attention's sake. Because it abuses our senses and it's ripped so many of us apart from our reality, the glory of the natural world can't even compete. The worst part is most of these ads don't even work. There's no reason our culture should be turning to shreds to get these views that prove nothing, to sell nothing. So, what's the solution? I don't know. Like I said, this is all a result of us exploiting our own human nature. And I don't see the way we behave as a problem to be solved, but more as a reality to be observed. But I do know just telling people to just get off their phones isn't good enough. We're gonna have to be more creative than that because that's like telling a man who lives in the suburbs to just not have a car. It's like, yeah, it's possible, but how else is he supposed to get around? How else is he supposed to see the people he loves? There's a road there. And when you live in a world that uses that road to function and you wanna be a part of that world, then you have no choice but to take it. It's frustrating. It definitely makes me feel powerless sometimes, but I talk about it because I feel like every artist should know about this. Every person should know about this. We're a species of the heart living in a world built for the eyeball.